I'm Madeline Pumariega, and what a great afternoon it has been. Really, all day since we kicked off this morning, we have talked about so many important topics. We've heard from the mayor, uh, just heard about the important role of small businesses and economic recovery here in Miami, so important for us, the role of travel and travel and tourism. And now we pivot to talent, to human capital. We know that the economic recovery and really the sustainability of all economic growth relies on our ability to harness human capital. Can we promise and deliver to business leaders across all sectors that they can count on higher education for the talent they need to grow and thrive? It's a question every day at Miami-Dade College that our leaders are engaged in, from our campus presidents to our, our partners, um, always asking what is the future of work? And what we do know is that the pandemic has accelerated that. Innovation and technology has been adopted much faster than we could ever have imagined. And so therefore, when we thought that we were planning on the future of work for 2030, it's arrived, it's here. And certainly um, on the platform of enormous digital disruption and adoption in the last less than really 24 months. And so I'm joined with an incredible group of panelists, one here with me. Bernard and I were just um, smiling that fortunately we can do this together here on stage. And um, virtually, we are joined by two incredible women leaders. Um, and so I'll do formal introductions and we'll jump right into questions. Uh, again, Bernard Meyerson, Chief Innovation Officer Emeritus from IBM, right here next to me. Lena Nair, Chief Human Resources Officer on Unilever, and she's with us. And Becky Frankowitz, President of Manpower North America, also with us. And so we can see you. It's been I really a great day of this hybrid type conference. You know, you always wonder, how are we going to manage folks um, in a virtual environment and then here in person? And we've, we've done that. So I'm going to start with the first question. And I think I'm going to ask each of you, and I'll start, if you don't mind, uh, with you, Lena. How do you see the future of work in your sector? What is it that you're seeing, the emerging trends, the emerging industries, and more importantly, the skills that we're going to need to have for the future of work? I'm so glad you said that in the beginning, that every time we talk about future of work or reskilling revolution, it feels like there's a lot of time. It's coming. We've got plenty of time to sort of do the right things. But what we really need to do is step up the sense of urgency across business, governments, academic institutions, because the future of work is here and it's now. You know, from where I sit in the fast-moving goods industry, you know, in the FMCG industry, we already see 40 or 50% of our jobs changing, the core skills that make up the job changing. We see technology changing almost 40% of the jobs. So skills are changing, technology is accelerating that even more. So it is here. And that's why, as Unilever, one of the, we made three big commitments in the beginning of this year. And I hope that inspires other companies. And I'm sure it will, because everyone is seeing this problem <coughs> being accelerated by the pandemic. So we made three commitments. One, that we would reskill and upskill everyone who works for us with a future fit plan by 2025. The second is we would, uh, we would pioneer new employment models to give everyone a different employment model, a choice of working in a different way, which I think the pandemic has already shown us that it's possible. And the third commitment we made is that we would skill up 10 million young people across the world with a future fit skill set, experiences, skills that make them relevant for the future. So future of work, when I look at the skills we need, it's a combination of what I call the hard skills, 
digital data, you know, everything that's needed to, to get on top of technology. And it's the soft skills that go with it, the humanity, the compassion, the empathy, the creativity. And it's really both of those sets of skills that we need in the future of work. And underlying all of that, the most important skill is the ability to learn, ability to learn really fast, call it learning agility, call it whatever you want. But being able to learn at the speed of light is one of the most important skills and abilities when we look at the future of work. Nina, thank you so much. That's so true. And I would add a skill in there of curiosity sets the framework for learning, right? Staying curious is so important. Bernard, I want to turn over to you, um, certainly with IBM. And I love the idea that Lena talked about what they're doing themselves at Unilever to train up and level up. Because I do think that every company has to be thinking about what is our talent management strategy. And it requires both the internal perspective and then the external partnerships. And you all have been phenomenal in developing those um, external partnerships, but also leveling up your own folks at IBM. Thank you. Um, IBM has a very long history, as you well know, in being engaged in this field of upskilling. And the reason is simple, which is, you know, you're a company that, give or take, has had three, 400,000 employees in a field that the velocity has become incredible. That's what's getting lost. I, I couldn't agree more uh, than with what was just said because what we used to think took 10 years now takes two years. And so you better get your act together or you basically fall behind. There are a whole series of programs that IBM has had over the years. I used to run, in fact, university relations. And as part of that, I traveled around the world and we would actually seed programs ahead of the need in various countries. Uh, we set up a a center, for instance, in applied data analytics in the, the National University of Singapore, which became very, very popular, but at the time it was a small field. Now it's everywhere, as was correctly said. Similarly, you have to look to the future for both internal and external. Internally, we actually have learning requirements. You can't just sit there. You literally have a commitment to spend about a week of your time literally picking up skills that you believe are additive to what you already have and enable you to move forward in the career. But similarly, outside the company, we started with a one-school experiment because underserved communities deserve the same treatment as anybody else. So we set up a system called P-TECH. And basically, it's a six-year program, four years of high school, two years continuing program that leave you with a, effectively a quite advanced degree in information technology where you were immediately marketable into the industry. And we constantly upgrade it. If you then move forward to this particular era where things have really become compressed because of the uh, pandemic, we now have something we call Open P-Tech, where we've expanded what had addressed something on the order of over 150,000 people. We're now at about 250,000. The schools alone have grown the P-Tech schools to about 220 globally. And Open P-Tech basically is a digital variant thereof to expand that even more. So, you know, it's really something where we also, how should, I assume, how should I say this? Never assume you are the sharpest tack in the box. Please don't be offended. Um, we, work, we work, for instance, with manpower because, of course, they see the immediate request for skills, and we want to make sure that when we're listening to them, we are training people in those skills in demand ahead of the curve. So similarly, we have a program we now set up called Skills Build, which addresses those gaps and preferably does it, believe it or not, in a span of something three to six months. It's very compressed. So there are many, many programs underway, but I couldn't agree more that the velocity in this field, particularly information technology, AI, machine learning, has driven us to have to roll out these programs quite quickly in order to simply stay ahead of the game. I love that. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Um, Becky, I want to go over to you and, and your lens in which you see things really is like a dual lens, uh, not only from Manpower's um, internal talent strategy, but working with your partners and their talent needs, uh, your insights. Yes, so thank you. Um, I feel like I have a front row seat to the biggest force transformation for sure of my lifetime and probably for most of our history. If we didn't know it before, the crisis reminded us of the importance of two things, transferable skills and reskilling. 
And I'm not talking about, you know, long programs that are going to take six months. I'm talking about reskilling in real time. You know, Lena said we have to act. There's a call to action. The call to action is for economic growth. Skills are moving at the pace of technology and skills have to keep up in the interest of economic growth. You know, gone are the days where we're helping people find job security. We as employers have to help people find employment security, not just job security. So that doesn't mean that companies are going to hire people and give them a guarantee for a lifetime of employment. But it means that we as employers have to commit to keeping people employable. Employability for all is what we have to stand for because our our environment, our world has gone through massive changes before now. Like it feels massive now, but we've gone through the industrial revolution. We've had significant changes happen, not at the speed of today, but significant changes happen. And the trick is keeping pace where skills can keep pace with technology. And that's what's different right now. It's human beings that have to keep pace with what's changing. And by the way, it's a two-way street. Employers have to provide constant learning and the offer of constant skilling and employees have to opt in. So that's really what's changing in today's environment is it is real time. It is required for economic growth and it is a two-party partnership, a new employment contract, if you will, for constant teaching and constant learning on behalf of the employee. I think that's wonderful. And I'm going to stick with you for just a minute uh, because you talked a little bit about it. Talk about the role of AI in automation. You know, I'm, I often say uh, to our folks about leveling up. You know, the kids that are gaming are always leveling up. It lets you go to that next level. And so I tend to even say level up instead of upskilling, right? Um, but talk a little bit about that in terms of just AI, automation, gamification, the just digital acquisition of how we do business. We know that AI is changing today the way that we work, the way that we play. Certainly, we heard earlier the way that we travel. Um, what kind of digital skills do you see there? What kind of demand do you see it? And what industries are leading that in terms of what they're doing internally to level up their employees? And what type of partnerships are you seeing as well? Yes, Malin, what a great territory and with a lot of questions that you just posed. So I'll I'll start with first being a digital leader. So we did an extensive study in 40 different countries to say, okay, what's required to be a digital leader? You know, as the leader, and the hypothesis, by the way, is there's been significant change. Like the leader of today is dramatically different than the leader of yesterday. 70% of the skills required to be an effective digital leader are the same to be a leader. So the right question, things like drive, ambition, curiosity. So curiosity as a leader isn't new. Um, Lena would probably tell you it was in the HR space 15, 20 years ago, learnability, learning agility. Um, It feels new today, but it's not new in the space. So then what is new? So to be a digital leader, it's fascinating. Informed risk-taking. Not just risk-taking, but informed risk-taking. The ability to develop talent the ability to develop talent and to do it at pace and to take bets on people to know where to put your appropriate bets and empathy. Empathy has risen significantly in the profile of a leader. And I'm not just talking about empathy, you know, that I care about you. Um, You have to be invested in me, not just as an employee, as your employee, but as a human being who's contributing to economic growth around the world. It's a different relationship. It's a deeper level of empathy. So that'd be the first thing that I'd say is, you know, about 30% of the requirements of being a digital leader are new. The good news for all of us as leaders or, or aspiring leaders or 70% of those skills are the same. In terms of partnerships, we are seeing private public enterprise partner in ways we've never seen before. Um, we at Manpower Group partnered with MXD out of Chicago to identify, and Bernard alluded to it earlier, to identify what is the next generation of skills that are going to be required in manufacturing 4.0. You didn't hear me say next generation of jobs, right? We started with next generation of skills, and that was university participation, big employer participation, consulting company participation, and manpower group participation to bring all the angles in so that we can see around the corner to help identify the skills and the adjacent skills, because adjacent skills tell you where people can actually level up, to use your word, Madeline, or to upskill. Um, We identified 164 new job taxonomies. 164 that don't exist today. And you might think, oh my gosh, that's a lot. Okay, they're probably 1,600 if we open the aperture and looked across other industries. And so this idea of the future of work is going to be constantly skilled. 
hyper flexible, more well-being focused, and really requiring employers and employees to jointly come together to educate and to learn continuously. It's a continual state of learning and change. Lena, I want to come to you on that because, so you're an employee, you're in HR, you've been in, you know, your career's been around HR, and certainly we hear it within the water coolers and, and Zoom chats. They, you know, about automation and AI and will it take my job, right? And so tell me what you're doing in the HR space. What can companies be doing, our global companies, in terms of um, establishing those opportunities to upskill their own employees and more importantly, create that path for a job that's not going to be there, but give that employee the <coughs> runway to pivot to another job. Because I think that's a real obligation that we have as leaders in our organizations is we can kind of see those jobs that aren't going to exist in a year or two. And so can you talk about from the HR perspective, not just training, development, but messaging? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I firmly believe that the future of work is going to be more jobs, not less. You know, as many jobs are getting displaced, they're going to be equal or more numbers created. That I feel extremely confident about, especially when you see some of the shortages that we're seeing across supply chains in the world for labor today, for frontline workers today. I can tell you there are going to be more jobs than people. So that's the good news. The challenge is to find the exact matching because you have people with skills who can't land into the right jobs. You have people whose jobs have got redundant, but we can, can't land them with the right skills. And that's why, crucially, you've heard all three speakers speak about the need to <coughs> reach up at all times because it's happening at pace. Jobs coming, jobs going, is happening at pace. Now, I believe that one of the ways to solve this is to have cross-industry partnerships. You know, I'll give you a simple example. We just partnered with Walmart on a pilot a bit earlier this year where we looked at 800 different jobs in manufacturing, you know, job family of about 80 jobs with, you know, about 5,000 employees impacted by those jobs. And we used AI to see what are the skills that people had. Because we've got to stop seeing jobs as jobs, but we have to see jobs and roles as a collection of skills. And we tried and assessed people on the kind of skills they've had they have, and you won't believe it, most people rank themselves as having about 11 skills, while the AI that we put into place actually showed that they had more skills than they thought they had. On an average, the AI technology identified 30, 40, 30 to 40 skills, while people only identified 11 or 12 skills in themselves. We then looked at jobs that uh -oh. and we said, can we pivot our people to tr get trained and move into jobs in Walmart. And we found that we could do, you know, it was possible. So it opened our eyes to the different opportunities that exist. And what we say is that if we can do it cross industry, we can find ways to match people and skills. I'm going to take a pause to see whether the connection is still on and people can see and hear us yet. You kid, you, you had a little, a couple of pauses, a uh, few hiccups, but uh, you got through clearly and we were able to uh, capture what you were saying. Um, Bernard, I want to pivot over to you. Certainly the partnership with IBM and Miami-Dade College and AI for all, uh, it's something at the college that we're committed. Instead of creating a pathway where you're an AI major. It's really about the integration of AI in all of the majors at Miami-Dade College. If you're going into healthcare, understanding how AI is going to change patient care. And if you're going into business and finance, um, how analytics and algorithms are going to certainly guide a lot of our decision making. And so with a great partnership, talk a little bit about AI automation. And I really think IBM's um, bold move to say we're here and we're going to help higher education meet the talent needs that we've heard from uh, both Lena and Becky. And one of the things that's a misconception is that you have to become the world expert at AI. 
In fact, if that's how your AI is designed, find another vendor. <laughs> um, that ain't how it's supposed to work. Uh, the point is, AI is a tool. It is an incredibly powerful tool. But as with any other tool, it's like learning to be a welder. You know, if you can be a very productive individual or you can make some horrific errors that are irreconcilable. In AI, it's not that different. You have to basically understand it as a tool. And yes, you can use it with tremendous impact in medicine because it can look at numbers of things at a rate and pace that a human can't. I'll give you an interesting example that's germane to what we're doing now. You know, I had somebody ask me about uh, why it took so long for the FDA to review the data that was given to them by Pfizer uh, and approve it. And um, one of the things you need to understand is scale, right? If you're given a billion and a half shots around the world, you got to turn in all the data that you gathered. You know, they turned over, last I heard, please don't choke me if I'm that far off, about 340,000 pages of data that had to be crawled through. Take my word, you do not do this by hand. You will miss something. So again, it's a tool. These are tools that can go through it and say, hey, did you notice these self-similarities? Another example is you need humanists. Thank you, it was said well. You know, AI is a tool. Well, guess what? They can work well and they can really be awful. It turns out they need to be transparent. There's an entire team of humanists who are working on making sure that it is transparent. The reason is it makes decisions that sometimes are irreconcilably stupid. And you look at them and you go, are you kidding? Because they demonstrate enormous bias. Why? Because somebody didn't set it up correctly. If the AI is transparent, it shows you why it made a decision. You say, oh no, we missed that one. And you correct it. So for every opportunity that goes away, there are three others that show up. You know, Ginny uh, Romani, our prior chairman, called the new collar jobs, which is sort of stuck. And there's a good reason for that. It is a huge opportunity for those of us who basically are looking for tiny signals in immense data. But that actually opens the world up to us. It doesn't close it off. There is a flip side to it that was alluded to, and there you have a real challenge. I actually work with the Global Manufacturing Industrialization Summit. These guys are based, uh, the last one was Abu Dhabi that I was at. And there, the fourth industrial revolution, which is the use of AI and machine learning to eliminate entire classes of jobs that can simply be done better with automation. Yes, you need to reskill the individuals involved ahead of that curve. So it's not all sunshine and light either. I don't mean to present it like that. It is a challenge to all of us where each of us in our industry have to look at it, say, where does it fit? Where does it cause a discontinuity and proactively address it? So again, you know, I, I being very careful to try to balance it, by no means it is the evil empire. I think it's an enormous opportunity for us. So true. You, I often say you can't microwave talent. Um, it takes time and it's some things you just can't do with the speed of light and even as we look at integrating AI among education, it's more about how can we put your skills as a human best at work doing things that make a difference and make an impact and take away those things that are repetitive that can be done through machines. And fortunately, we um, haven't yet programmed um, machines that have empathy, but we do as humans. And that's what makes us special and so important to keep at the forefront of all of these decisions. I want to come back, Becky, to you and talk about, you know, if we surveyed this room of business leaders and we surveyed everyone joining us virtually, probably I would say that around 80% would say higher education is not doing enough to meet my talent needs, um, not fast enough, not nimble enough. And I would say it really takes a partnership. What do you think the role of the private sector is alongside public sector, government, uh, Department of Labor, US DOE, and higher education institutions on talent management strategy for the global economy and really across the world? Yeah, so first I would say you hit on the answer, which is partnership. I mean, it's going to take all of us coming together because the entire structure of the workforce has changed around the world. And what I mean by that, and, and Lena touched on it, we think of ourselves as, hey, if I go to university or I go to a trade school, this is my job. Therefore, this is what I do. And now we've learned through the crisis that what you did 
it is not necessarily what you have to do in the future. It's really about the skills that you demonstrated in your job. And so think about when people say, what do you do? You know, I'm a program manager. No, no. What are the skills that you use in your job? And so that'd be the first thing I would say that for, for both public and private university and, and community colleges, we have to start helping students think about the skills that they're acquiring and structure our you know, courses around skills versus the idea of I'm going to grow up as a finance major and therefore I'm going to work in finance for the rest of my life. It's what are the skills that being a finance major or a marketing major or an international business major, what are the skills that you will gather? And then therefore, what are the options that opens up for you? Um, because one of the gifts of the crisis is we saw people change industries. And you might be thinking, oh, well, that's common. Not common. Before the crisis, people grow up in an industry and tend to stay in the industry. But when whole industries closed, like hospitality and leisure, workers had to migrate. And wh what did they do? They migrated to in-demand, you know, spike industries like grocery, logistics, warehousing. And we work directly with people in hospitality. When you ask them what they were doing or what their job was, they tell you their title. And we had to sit and talk to tens of thousands of people around the world on, no, no, not your title, not the company you worked for. what did you do every day? What, what did you love about what you did? And then help them translate that into the future skill. So back, back to education, I do think it's a partnership and I'll, I'll be a little um, constructively critical of, of myself and my, our own industry as employers and say, there's also a piece of this, Madeline, that we step back on our job descriptions and talk about not what's desired in a job, but what's truly required in the job. And what I mean by that is 90% of IT jobs in the U.S. today require a computer science degree, 90%. 43% of people who work in the IT field have one. So it tells you that we're still listing these requirements as employers that aren't necessarily matching not only our previous actions, but definitely not matching the talent pool and aren't using skill um, forward in terms of how we're hiring people. And so I'd say for education, we need to think about skills and helping people define the skills they want to develop and what they study and how it gives them those skills versus, you know, majors in the traditional sense. And from a private sector perspective, we have to start getting very clear on what's desired versus what's required in a job. That's so good. I, I think about the, the future of education being much more about skill acquisition and less about credit accumulation. Our, our, our system is really built on degree, you know, credit accumulation that leads to a degree. And I think the future of work is much more about skill acquisition and being nimble enough. And I see that shift starting to happen. Just this summer, in a partnership with Amazon Web Services, they hired two of our students at the associate level. That had been traditionally a four-year entry point. And so we in cybersecurity and other areas are creating programs that are stackable. You can come in and just earn certificates and industry certifications, and those lead right into associate degrees, and the associate degrees lead, leading into bachelors of applied sciences so that they have that real work experience. But I want to come, Lena, to you on the talk about internships and paid internships and work-based learning, which is so critical in bridging the gap between applied learning and skill acquisition. And certainly when we think about ensuring we've got pathways for those often underrepresented in tech fields and in emerging industries, we can talk a little bit about that from your perspective. Yes. Uh you know, I, I know the forum I'm speaking to, but I'm going to therefore venture and say that I really believe that the current learn everything you can before 2122 university education is a broken model. We really have to rethink how we train our young, much more apprenticeship schemes, internships, in experiences, adult learning, sabbaticals for adults to keep coming back to academic institutes and learn theory and learn concepts again in new fields. That's the, we need to see a far more dynamic role for academic institutions in the future. And I hope you are at the front end of thinking about that. Because I do think the current model is broken. It's not going to serve us for very long. You know, when I, in my job, I, I have the opportunity to look across the world and see governments responding in different places, see how private and public partnerships are coming together. 
And one of the places I'm impressed with is Singapore. And I talk a lot about how they are approaching future work to our government in UK, where I'm based. So what they've done is they've reached out to industry and said, hey, you've got to take, let's say, a company like Unilever. You've got 600 interns. We as the government are going to pay for these 600 to be trained. You've got to provide a one-year experience for them to be trained in skills of the future, you know, AI, digital tech, software coding, whatever they may, it might be, based on the person's interest and, uh, and aptitude. So we need governments to lean in like that because companies will be willing to provide more and more opportunities and experiences, but they'll be limited by how many they can do. I mean, I, I already feel bad about the fact that we have something like 2 million people who apply to us across the world, and we can give jobs to about 10,000, 13,000. But we could create internship opportunities, volunteering opportunities, experience opportunities for quite a lot more than we recruit. So I think there's a real opportunity here to reframe a three or four year undergraduate degree or graduate degree into a very different proposition where there's a lot of back and forth with industry, in industry, to bridge that gap way early. Because if you see the training budgets of most organizations, they're massive. They're massive. And we could, you know, save on some of that budget if we could ensure that many of those skills came to us from people coming from academic institutes, fully trained and fully ready. And that would be a nice return for businesses as well. So, yes, there's new ways of doing these things, and there's new ways if we partner with governments, with businesses, mm -hmm. academic institutions, to fundamentally pioneer a different way of getting people ready for work. Thank you so much. Bernard, all is said and done, and we can say that these alternative skills, and so I'll ask you probably a couple part question. One, let me frame with, in 2008, 2009, during our last economic recession, when we recovered jobs, we recovered 11.6 million jobs. Of that, 11.3 million went to individuals with some college. Um, during that same time, for sure, we thought higher education would be gone through massive online open courses, free. And so that was going to be the biggest disruption to higher education. And what we have found years later is those that enrolled in MOOC courses already had a baccalaureate degree and were really upskilling. So how do we know the skills when they're not on those degree pathways, those traditional pathways that they really lead to economic mobility? What skill validation tools can we have and how can we then ensure economic mobility for everyone? All right, there, that's about a four and a half hour lecture, so I'm gonna cut it to about three. I'm gonna cut that to about three <laughs> I, I, I gave you a warning, right? Yeah, I told right, you yes. this was a multi part one. There it is, one. thunk. <laughs> oh, um, well, okay, let me, let me try one approach. All right, we'll go for one. There are many answers. Um, open. That is, if I got to give you a one word answer, it's kind of interesting. You know, large organizations, large companies have for years and years and years taken their most advanced technologies, hidden them in under, and then sprung them on society at a later time. Well, that has a real problem, which is if you're going to upskill people to address a new need, how do you do that if they have no clue what's coming? All right. This is a foundational change in how corporations behave, where you actually throw the doors open very early in the new skill area. And you say, here it is, go for it. And you open it to universities, you open it to private individuals. And I'll give you two examples, one IBM, one outside. Um, quantum computing is something that we have really been taking the lead in and, and driving very, very hard. There are no skills in quantum computing. You know, there's not a lot of people out there who understand how to drop liquid helium into a doer and pump on it to get the temperature down to millikelvin so the computer works. This is not a long list of people. Not to mention the coding is entirely new. So we've opened it up, and many universities right now around the world, I would probably guess there are a couple of hundred, if not a few thousand people now working on something that is not yet even being commercially sold. Why? Because if you want to know who's good at a new skill and you want to upskill your own people, you throw it out there and let people work on it. So engagement, direct engagement. So that's one example. A different example in a totally different field, um, which I really admire because it took guts. General Electric builds 
Uh, how, many, how many of you folks flew here on something? Boy, you guys walk long distances. Um, <laughs> wow, damn, I'm, I'm impressed. Latin America, wow. Okay, um, regardless if you swam, the point is that GE builds the jet engines that hang under the wings of countless aircraft. And one of the challenges they have is getting rid of weight. Well, there's a part of the plane that's basically a big chunk of metal that holds the engine onto something important called the wing. Um, really, really <laughs> important thing. They decided, actually, it's used maneuvering the thing during maintenance also. And um, they got gutsy. They said, you know, we could start a research program to build these things very light and very special using entirely new technologies we're not even expert at. Or I can offer $20,000. You've got to love this. This would have cost millions in the company. I will offer a $20,000 reward to somebody who comes up with a design that meets all the specs. Here are the specs. That is the ultimate open. And believe it or not, somebody in Indonesia sat down and designed a winning part that actually met all the specs. The poor the guy got $7,000 and a hell of a job offer. Um, but the fact is, that's open. And he, they created this group out there working on 3D printing using lasers and metal. Again, sometimes upskilling is really throwing the doors open even to your own people. It's very important you not lock people into one area. And the open is a whole new, you know, ball of wax, and it's been coming forever, and people ignored it. Uh, Linux was developed by an open community of software programmers who contributed to it. That's a perfect example. Well, it's now become de rigueur, as opposed to an option. So I could go through the 84 other explanations. I'm going to stop there. I love that. I love the idea that um, the openness, right, instead of blindsiding uh, higher ed or society and saying, now I need 1,000 of them. Well, when you were developing, could you have had a conversation with us? I think it's the important importance of having advisory boards for workforce programs, having those key uh, business and industry leaders helping align curriculum uh, to the future of work. Becky, I want to go back to you on the economic mobility question. How do we know the skills that are gained are those that are going to lead um, towards a path of economic mobility? There's no doubt in the globalization of the economy, certainly in the gig economy, it really does bring uh, economic mobility, a whole new definition, not just community-based, but really globally based. And just your thoughts there. Yeah, first, Madeline, I want to go back to something I think that you said that I think is really profound. When you talked about the 11.1 .1 million people who went through programs were people who already had some amount of education. I think the defining challenge for all of us as employers is for the people making employability for all. So not just for those that are going to learn it anyway, but for those who need it most. And that requires, you know, economic mobility requires that we actually know where skills are moving for the future and help people map themselves there. So the employer part of that contract is you have to know where your business is going in the future. IBM working on quantum computing. They know that's a bet for them. I'm sure Unilever has bets. And so part of my job at Manpower Group is understanding the landscape of where skills are going to be required and then going and building that talent. And you, you can't build, I loved your language, Madeline, around stackable. You can't build anymore for people who are working and earning. They have to learn while they earn. And so you have to have really stackable components. And that requires understanding where are they today? Where is the, the skill set going in the future? Where are the jobs are going to be in demand in the future? And then what are the learning stacks, the learning modules that you can stream together while they're earning to make sure that they are ready for that next job that, by the way, gives them increased pay and skill advancement and reduces, you know, the exposure they have um, to a job that won't be in demand or won't pay in demand in the future. And so that, to me, is economic mobility. It's the employee being willing to learn, but it's the employer having the plan to help people path their way to a different future. And at, at Manpower Group, we have a program called My Path that does exactly that. We help in manufacturing, for example, we have eight pathways that help people map from where they are, low demand skills or jobs into high demand jobs, and they can earn while they learn. And that makes employability for all, not just employability for people who are, you know, already educated and naturally curious and going to make the time to go learn something new. We have to create that space as employers. Again, economic growth and, and human livelihood depends on it. 
excellent point. And I <clears throat> want to come back, Lena, to a question to you about um, human resources, the future of work. We've, we've talked this afternoon about skill acquisition. We've talked about a global economy, digitization. How do you see the future of work in a new economy emerging post um, COVID, which may not be brick and mortar, um, which may be much more remote working, virtual working. What would you say to everyone watching and in the room are a couple of things that you need to be thinking about from an HR perspective as you're putting in the culture of the future of work? You know, we've talked a lot about skills, and I think there's this piece that really uh, successful people have and successful companies have, and it's the culture, that culture of excellence. How do you do that when everyone's not in the room? Yeah, it's a great point. You know, uh, the how we work in the future, that question has come alive to all of us. I do think all through last year and this year, each of us has asked the question, do we need to continue working in the way we always did? You know, wake up in the morning, you commute for a few hours, you get to a place to work, you spend long days there, you travel without question. And we do this for like 40, 50 years of our life. And one day sort of we retire, relax or whatever happens next. And we've all asked ourselves, isn't it time to challenge this out, outdated way of working, this traditional models of employment? So my first piece of advice to everyone is this is a time we have to experiment with new models of employment. And as Unilever, we are putting our money where our mouth is and we're experimenting with a four-day working week in New Zealand. It's only 90 people in New Zealand experimenting it, but it's pretty much got global headlines for four-day working week. We're trying something called You Work in the UK where people can say, hey, I want to work for between six weeks to six months with the company and the rest of the time I want to do other things and we're providing people with a flexible option and with a secure job to be able to do that. We're, we, we're experimenting with a model called uh, you renew, which is people can take sabbaticals which partly the company sponsors, partly the person is to sponsor. I think the bigger point is we're really trying to experiment with every form of hybrid model that exists to be able to break the traditional models of employment and come up and pioneer the new employment models that the world so desperately needs. But I do think your question on culture is a very important one. I mean, culture, yes, is the glue that holds the company together. Culture can eat strategy for breakfast. Culture is that which is the intangible that allows the company to perform better. So how do you keep culture going when people may see each other very rarely? Mm. So my, my sort of uh, few words of wisdom to our teams planning for this across the world is that we've got to find new ways of embedding culture. You know, you've got to, yes, there's a minimum time in office we'd want people to come to, you know, maybe 40% of their time or whatever it is. But it may not be in the old way of thinking that people will turn up for two days a week and the rest they'll work out of anywhere. It's about challenging saying, can we do that differently? Can we have the four days they're going to, eight days they're going to come into office be done in a different way where they truly come just to collaborate, have meetings, be productive, but not do any individual work those days, but just to group work, create a work, in a way to work, things that give them joy, almost workshop things for four or five days in a month for the teams. So, yes, culture is important, but we have to think new ways of embedding symbols, stories, behaviors, role modeling, than the face-to-face -face way that we are all used to. Because let's face it, our world has fundamentally changed. It's not going to be possible to tell people, just pretend COVID didn't happen and do exactly everything that you did in 2019 or 2018. I think that's gone. We've got to pioneer and find a new way that combines the best of both worlds. Because, hey, we've also enjoyed some of the flexibility the last 18, 20 months has given us. We don't want to give that away. But we also want the human connection that we've missed so badly. So we've got to find a way to move to a new world where we combine the best of both worlds. 
in fact everywhere i see communication that says return to the workplace return to the <laughs> i said there's no returning there's only going forward the returning is gone it's a going forward so true um, earlier this morning, we had breakfast at Roundtable, and we were talking about this is the new normal. Um, for those that say, you know, when we get back to how it was, this is not going back. We're going forward and, and embracing it. Bernard, you advise um, leaders from across every sector, um, leaders really across the world, government leaders. Um, what's the conversation in the boardroom right now? It is a different world. You're right. The world is foundationally different. People thought this would be the end of the world, and it turns out that people have adapted, and they've adapted rapidly. You know, you have to have faith in your team. They know their mission. They know what they've got to get done. And it has been remarkable how well it has worked in this hybrid mode that we're now operating. Saying that you will either, you know, everybody's returning to the office or nobody's returning to the office, it's nonsense. Every organization has high, especially one of our size, is very disparate. And there will be people who actually want to and need to be in. You know, I, I grew up my first 10 years at IBM. I was a hands-on scientist on the bench building things. No offense, but my arms aren't long enough to build them for my house. That's not going to happen. You, you, you're in. Yeah, there you go. And by the way, that works great. But there are other people who've been there 25 years. They're working in a team that has some incredible incredibly important work to be done for, let's say, a national government, a foreign government, a foreign company. And they're very comfortable with one another. They've known each other their whole careers, and they're perfectly happy to get together once a month and see one another. And other than that, they're going to work remotely. The trick is, A, it's going to be hybrid. I don't care what you call it. It's going to be a mixture. And B, you've got to be flexible. It will not be fixed in time. If there's any lesson that we learned through the course of this pandemic, is there's nothing that is fixed. If you go back just, what, four months, how many of you were told, hey, it's over? You know, you watched the rate of infection drop like stone and followed by, oh yeah, Delta. And there, well, there we go again. Um, there is no one solution here. And part of the problem is when people try to write those, you get in real trouble. It is a dynamic situation. We have proven it can work. That's a really remarkable thing. The economy did not collapse. There's a lesson in that. And so when you tell people, you have to come back, I got some bad news about, you know, the competition for talent. The competition for talent is real high, and if you really aggravate somebody, guess what they do? They vote with their feet. So we as leaders need to be adept at sensing where the, you know, where their beliefs are and how we accommodate them with some reasonable set of choices. You don't want to commit, um, you know, corporate suicide, obviously. You, there is some balance, but that's the key word, balance. You can't be dictatorial about it. It will end very, very badly. So I, I couldn't agree more with what's already been said, which is you have to look at the situation as it evolves because it will continue to evolve. We're not going back to where we were. That's not, a, that's not an option. So true. Becky, we have some students in the room, and if they were building their resume right now, how will the new resume change? When you're looking at manpower at thousands and you're, you know, matchmaking uh, skills and fit, um, tell us about the new resume. And what a great question. So welcome to all you students. Um, look me up when you're ready to find employment. I'd be happy to engage. Uh, but the, it is a new resume. And I love, Madeline, how you phrase that. Because what we're looking for today is your agility, your flexibility, your learnability, and the fact that you've been able to stack your skills. And so lead with your skills, lead with what you've learned, and lead with how you've learned. Because employers today, and, and you know, I loved your question on how are you, you know, what's the talk in the boardroom? Um, from the boardroom, you know, from Wall Street to Main Street, the conversation is on attracting and retaining talent. And so if you think about the attraction part, which is where your question centers, it's truly around you know, how you learn. Do you have a, do, are you voracious learner? Like I was a voracious reader when I was growing up. Are you a voracious learner? Because your ability to learn and to learn again and to learn again is going to be the, in future, the future of employment. And for you to want to want to live that life, um, we look at, you know, definitely looking for a nice um, STEAM kind of experience. So you want to see the sciences, you know, whether you are a science major or not irrelevant, but want to see that you have the core fundamentals of scientific method. 
want to see that you have some arts, that you're curious about how, you know, things work together in the ecosystem around you. And so it's so much more, you know, the classes that you chose to take and the skills that you can articulate, you glean from those classes. That's what employers today want to see. Thank you. It's so, um, so it's an exciting time. As much as it might be scary, I think about just the future of work um, really being an exciting time, the way that we're able to adopt technologies, the way that we're able to almost co-create our jobs together with our, with our leaders, right? And so, you know, what we've heard today, three set of skills, the applied skills, that that you learn from reading and math and science and history, because I don't want to leave today without saying the importance of being a global citizen and understanding that we're the citizens of the world. And that means that we have a sense of ownership around resiliency and climate that we do around civic engagement, about caring for those individuals around us. But the second set of skills, those future-proof skills, design thinking, critical thinking, curiosity, those that are so important that you really acquire through teamwork, you acquire through clubs and organizations. If you're in college, you acquire by committees. You know, I know that sometimes we say, oh, not another committee or not another task force, but it is where you learn <coughs> that teamwork and, and the sharing of information. And then I think the third set of skills we heard so clearly and so importantly are the digital skills. Not digital skills like we saw at the turn of the year 2000, but real smart digital skills in terms of automation and AI and quantum computing and all of the things that are really going to change and transform everything that we do. And so it's an exciting time. As we're under five minutes, I just want to turn to each one of our panelists and just one minute of a round robin of what you'd like to share about the future of work. And we'll, um, we'll start with Lena, we'll go to Becky, and then close up here in person with Bernard. Uh, there's just one thing I want to underline, even as the acquiring skills really important we focus on our inner game as well. You know, one of the things we do in Unilever is put all our people through Discover Your Purpose workshops because we believe if you know what you're purposeful about, if you know what you're passionate about, you learn so much better. We all of us only learn in areas that we truly care about. We're not going to learn just because it's great on a map and it tells me I'll get better jobs. I might do it but I really excel when I do something that I find meaningful and, and I would learn in anything that I find meaningful. So I would emphasize as well that it's important to work on your purpose, on what you're passionate about and your well-being. Because if you don't feel well, trust me, you're not going to want to learn anything. So making sure your mental fitness is as good as your physical fitness is hugely important to ensure you can survive and thrive in the future of work. Thank you so much. Becky. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, the, as I mentioned, the future of work is going to be constantly skilling. So we think, I don't want us to think of reskilling as, oh, it's a point in time and then we're there. Constantly skilling, hyper flexible and more well-being focused to Lena's point she just made than we can ever imagine. The employer-employee contract has changed. And now it is a mutual contract of, I expect of as, as an employee, I expect a values-driven company that aligns to my values, that you to take a stand on things. So I know that I'm voting my skills towards my values. I, of course, expect fair wages and the ability to continue to grow my career. And I expect fairness. And on the employer side, I expect contribution and productivity. Um, and in return, I'm going to give you an environment where you can continue to grow and develop your career. And so the future of talent, we, we, we will continue to have a talent shortage. You know, Lena opened with that around the mismatch and the fact that more jobs are going to cre be created. She's exactly right. We 
we are going to have more jobs than human beings in the world. And as a result, it's going to be a workers market. And so we as employers have to recognize that workers are like consumers. Think about, you know, you're a consumer. Um, I buy from Amazon. I used to wait two weeks for something to get here. Now I can have it in two hours. That kind of flexibility as consumers, we're now expecting as employees. So we're expecting the consumerization of the work experience and that I can work when I want, where I want, contribute, how I choose to contribute. And I'm going to give you my very best. So it's not a one-sided relationship, but I expect that flexibility in return. And so that's what I would say, you know, employees are going to vote with their skills um, and they're going to vote with their values. And that's a new environment for the workers market. That's great. Bernard. Yeah, I want to take it up a level. Um, one of the words that I really want to use here and, and close with is diversity. You know, we must not lose sight of that. That is basically the, the, the touchstone of our success. Because if you think about it, you know, as a company that has operated in 170 countries, take my word, you know, we've been in more countries than are listed in the UN for crying out loud. Diversity is an incredibly powerful aspect of how you work across all people's, all skill levels. And it has, diversity is not a simplistic term. We tend to think of it just as the obvious form of diversity. Yes, P-TECH was set up in, in Bed-Stuy, one of the toughest areas of New York. Why? Because we want to encourage diversity among people who may never had the opportunity to even participate in IT. That's a little piece of it. We have research centers around the world, in Africa and in Asia, you name it. Why? Because we want to encourage that. But there's also a diversity in skills where you bring people together, and you'd be amazed how positive it can be. Uh, there's a simple example I'll give from Singapore where they built a building called Fusionopolis and one side is the soft skills and the other side is basically the deep technical geeks. And they make damn sure they interact because you know what? Each learns from the other. There's tremendous power in diversity and going forward, you know, you ignore it at your own peril because people do not even want to engage a company that does not have practices in that space. And as was well said, recruiting now is a battle. And you better pay attention to those things that turn people on and turn people off. So, you know, again, I'd like to just close with that plea that people pay attention to this. This shouldn't be a competitive thing. This should just be something we all engage in. I heard purpose, passion, value-driven, leveling up consistently and constantly, and most importantly, making sure that we have an inclusive environment that we bring everyone up because there's more jobs than people. And so we really have to double down on our investments in human capital across the world. Lena, Becky, Bernard, thank you so very much. And to everyone listening to us and everyone here in the room, thank you.